Hello, everyone. Uh, good evening. Hello, everyone. Uh, good evening, and welcome to the third meeting of the NLP IL Vision Language Club. Tonight, we are honored to uh, have with us Ilan Hefel, who will be presenting Google's new text to video model, Lumiere. I hope I'm saying it right. Ilan is a PhD yeah. candidate at Tel Aviv University at Baita Professor Leo Wolf and a research intern at Google Tel Aviv. Her research is centered on computer vision and multimodal learning. Her work focuses particularly on developing methods to understand deep neural networks and leveraging their insights to enhance expressiveness, robustness, and fairness of the model. If you have any questions, please write them in the chat. We will have two short breaks in which Ila will address those questions, time allowing. Uh, just so you know, a recording will be made available on our YouTube channel for those who cannot join us uh, live. So without further ado, let's dive into the world of video generation with Lumiere. Please join me in welcoming Hila. Hila, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you so much, Dan, for that wonderful introduction. I don't think I could have made it better myself. Um, so as Dan said, we're going to talk about Lumiere, our new text-to-video model uh, from Google Research, which is a space-time diffusion model. And we'll understand what that means in a few seconds. But before we dive into the technical details of Lumiere, I just wanted to mention that this work is an amazing collaboration with a lot of co-authors that you're seeing right now on the screen. So it's been a lot of months of very hard work, of collaboration between the team, the research team in Tel Aviv and in Cambridge. So I just wanted to recognize all those amazing people who contributed greatly to the paper. So I think Dan pretty much introduced me perfectly, so I don't have a lot more to say about myself. My name is Ila, PhD candidate at Tel Aviv University. And in this work, I got to do an amazing thing, develop uh, a foundation model from scratch. So this was a really cool experience for me, which I hope I can share with you successfully during the next hour that we have together. So let's take a look at some of the topics that we're going to review during this talk. So first of all, Lumiere is an inflated text-to-image model. So first of all, we're going to take a look at what that means and understand what inflation is and how we inflate text-to-image models into text-to-video models. We're also going to talk about some of the challenges that are standing in our way with this inflation scheme. Then we're going to dive into the architecture of Lumiere and see how we solve some of the, the issues that we have with inflation. Um, then we're going to talk about the initialization of the model, which is going to be very important um, for the convergence of the model. Then we're going to talk about the spatial super resolution model, which basically takes low resolution videos and turns them into high resolution videos, as you're seeing here. It's probably a bit cut off because of the Zoom, so I'm sorry, but you can see all the results on our website as well. And then finally, we'll get to the most interesting and fun parts, which are results and the applications. So as I said, we'll begin with inflation, or how we turn text-to-image models into text-to-video models. The intuition behind inflation is pretty simple. We have these amazing text-to-image models that are both public and proprietary, right? We have Stable Diffusion Extra Large, which is now pretty much as amazing as uh, some of the proprietary models that uh, some of the companies have. And these models generate high quality frames, but then the issue is that these frames are kind of inconsistent. They don't construct an actual cohesive video. So the goal of inflation is to add those uh, orange temporal layers that we're seeing here, such that the temporal layers will connect between those random noises in order to generate coherent videos. So basically, we want to leverage as much information as we can from the spatia layers, from the blue layers, and add the uh, orange temporal layers in order to ensure that the video is consistent and coherent. And the reason that we do inflation is that the two tasks of image generation and video generation are somewhat related. So it seems that if we start from an image generation model, we're pretty much at a good initialization point. And remember this point because it's going to come back to us when we talk about the model and its initialization. But then more so than in image generation, video generation is very expensive computationally. And why is that? We know that the spatial layers are already pretty heavy, right? We have a lot of parameters here. So first of all, we added an additional significant amount of parameters in the temporal layers. So that's one reason why this is expensive. But the other reason, and maybe the more profound reason why it's so expensive to generate videos is that we need to generate a long amount of frames, right? A large amount of frames. So we don't need just one frame or one image. We need the entire temporal duration of a video. And in this talk, we're going to focus on videos that are five seconds long, okay, with 80 frames. So basically, we need to generate 80 frames at once. 
So this is computationally usually infeasible, right? We're going to need to process a lot of frames together. So this is going to be very expensive. And then the approach that people took prior to Lumiere to solve this issue is a two-step approach. The first step means instead of generating the entire temporal duration of the video, we're going to generate keyframes. And you can think about those keyframes as anchors that kind of span the entire temporal duration of the video, right? So we're going to generate those anchor frames that are going to determine the overall motion in the video. And then the second step is the temporal super resolution step, where we fill in each one of the frames between uh, the keyframes that we generated. So let's take a look at how this is done. Again, we're talking about a framework of 80 frames. This is the framework that we worked with for Lumiere. So instead of generating 80 frames together, which is computationally typically infeasible, right? If you're not open AI. <laughs> uh, so instead of generating all the 80 frames together, we're going to generate eight keyframes. So T1, T10, T20, and so on and so forth until T80. And those keyframes are going to determine the overall motion of the video. And then once we have generated those keyframes, we have those windows where we need to fill in the missing frames. And that's where the temporal super resolution model comes into play. So the temporal super resolution model is going to look at each one of those windows and do what we call frame interpolation in order to fill in the missing frames in each one of the windows. So in a sliding window approach, we go over all the windows and filling the missing frames until we're done and we filled in all the frames in the video. So basically a two-step approach. We have the base model generating distant keyframes, and then we have a temporal super resolution model which fills in the windows that are missing the frames. And this approach, by the way, was prominent for Imagine Video, uh, Make a Video, and so many other video models that we know uh, that existed prior to Lumiere. Now, we have a few issues with that keyframe approach, which those issues were actually the motivation for Lumiere and for the design that we came up with. So the first problem that we can think about is maybe the most basic problem. This is a very convoluted system, right? If I want to generate a very long video, those keyframes need to be very distant from each other because I have a very limited amount of frames that I can generate at once. So if I want a very long video, those frames are going to be at a very low FPS. For example, in Imagine Video, the base model generates uh, the, the base frames, the keyframes in three FPS, which is very low for a video, right? And then we, we're going to need a convoluted system of several temporal super resolution models in order to get to our final FPS, right? Because each one of these models can only process a limited amount of frames at once. Uh, so maybe in Imagine Video in the paper, they mentioned, I think that they used three temporal resolution models. So we have a cascade of models, which makes inference kind of a, a more of a pain because you need to do inference with several models, the base model, and then temporal super resolution, and another temporal super resolution, and so on and so forth. But this problem is maybe a secondary problem, because we know that right now we can speed up diffusion models with LCMs and so on. So maybe we could have ignored the problem if that was the only problem that existed, or we could improve uh, the performance of the model if that was the only problem that existed. The case study that we're going to use to show the next problem, which is the more profound problem in my humble opinion, is Imagine Video, another model from Google Research, which uses that cascaded approach. So in this video, we asked Imagine Video to generate a figurine, a wooden figurine of a man walking on a treadmill. So if you take a look at the actual motion of the video, I know it's somewhat cut off because of the zoom, but I hope you can see that the legs are not really portraying motion that is meaningful, that makes sense. The legs are jittering, popping, disappearing sometimes. Um, and the analysis that we've made in the paper is that we took that specific slice, spatial slice of the video, which shows the legs, right? Features the legs of the figurine. And we showed that slice across the entire video, just to show you what the motion of the leg looks like across the video frames. And here it's called, right, by the way, XT slice visualization. And you can see in the XT slices, the jittering and the jumping in the leg here and the disappearing of, of the leg in some of the frames here. So you can see that the motion is very much not coherent. Now let's think of why this is happening or why the motion is not coherent. As far as I'm concerned, there are two main intuitive points that we can think about that cause this incoherence issue. 
The first one is, as I said before, if we want to generate a very long video, then the keyframes, the distant keyframes, are going to be at a very low FPS. It means that the keyframes temporally are very remote from each other. So basically, the base model has a very complicated task. It needs to generate very distant keyframes, right, in time, such that those keyframes can later be interpolated into motion of legs that actually make sense. So the model needs to generate something that the temporal super resolution models can then interpolate into motion that makes sense. And that's a hard task. If you generate all the frames in the video at once, then the variation between each one of the frames is smaller or even very small subjectively, right? Because each movement will be kind of a slight variation of the previous frame. So generating all the frames in terms of generating, you know, each frame separately is much easier because the delta between each one of the frames is much smaller. So the task of the base model is that much harder when you need to generate very distant keyframes. And then also we saw that the temporal super resolution model works in windows that are not overlapping. And then the temporal super resolution does not see the other windows. So it doesn't have global context on the motion. Did I move the lag backwards in the previous window? Did I move it forward? Not sure. So those two issues are causing re real problems that we're seeing here in the exercise visualization with the motion coherence. So ba the basic intuition behind Lumiere will be, we don't want to do this cascaded approach. We want to generate the entire temporal duration of the video at once. And this will allow us two things, to solve two issues. The first one is the most prominent one, in my opinion, learning globally coherent motion, meaning getting rid of the issues that we saw before of the jittering and the missing legs and so on. And the second one is a simple framework. So we're going to get rid of all the cascades and all the temporal super resolution models that were several sometimes. For example, as I said, imagine video, I think in the paper uh, used three cascaded temporal super resolution model. So the motivation is to both improve the global coherence of the motion and have a simple framework. And just to give us some motivation as to what this is doing and that this is actually working to solve the issue that we saw before, on the left here is the video of the figurine walking that we saw with Imagine Video. And what we did is we generated the same video conditioned on the first frame from Imagine Video such that the appearance will match. And we generated it with Lumiere. So I'm not sure if you can see here or if Zoom is kind of cutting off the video. Um, but if you saw here, the motion of the legs is much better than it was for Imagine Video. And in the XT slice visualizations, you can see that all the jittering and the cutting off of the legs is kind of removed. So the motion is much more coherent. Um, and this is the effect of basically generating all the frames at once instead of generating distant keyframes and then doing a frame interpolation. And again, I hope you're seeing this, but if not, everything exists on our web page and in our paper. OK, so as I said, we want to generate our frames at once. But how? <laughs> the entire point of the cascaded approach was that we couldn't generate all the frames at once because it was computationally infeasible. So we're going to have to do some changes to the architecture in order to make that happen or make that feasible for the model in terms of the memory and in terms of the computation. So this is where I want to kind of plug into Lumiere's architecture. But if you have any questions so far, that would be a great point to stop and kind of uh, ask questions, because th these are the principles that Lumiere is kind of built on. So uh, I understand a question in the chat. Can you uh, repeat briefly what the uh, temporal um, OK, the problem with several temporal super resolution was that each model didn't have the glo global context that the other models had with the movement. So I think what uh, Eli is asking is, can you explain the temporal um, aliasing issue one more time? Yeah, sure, sure, sure. So we had two problems that we were talking about. Uh, was the question about the uh, temporal aliasing or the uh, windows that are not overlapping? Or should I just repeat both? <laughs> so the first I issue- I think just thinking, shortly uh, explain yeah. that. So just very briefly, uh, the first problem that we talked about related more to uh, temporal aliasing because we talked about the base model generating distant keyframes, right? And when you, when you talk about temporal aliasing, you usually have that uh, fan example, right? 
uh, if you take two frames of a fan that is spinning and you see the fan at the exact same position, is the fan spinning right or is it spinning left? So you can think about temporal aliasing kind of like you get two frames that are distant from each other. What happened in between? You, you can't always know. It's always ambiguous in some, in some sense, unless your keyframes are very close to each other or unless the motion is very slow or very clear. So for example, something that moves in a straight line, okay? So if you have leg motion and you can think about the legs kind of being at the same spot or a person doing jumping jacks, jumping up, you know, out and, and uh, back in, or a person doing uh, walking and, and moving his legs back to the same location, if I move my legs back to the same location, did I take my right leg back before or did I take it to the front before? If I want to kind of generate a repetitive motion where my legs go back and forth and back and forth. So temporal aliasing means that Based on those frames, I don't exactly know what's the motion that happened in between. So that's the issue that we have to deal with when we generate very distant keyframes. Okay, and that issue is solved when we generate all the frames or the entire temporal duration of the video because the motion is kind of gradual between the frames. So the movement or the shift between the frames is smaller. Is that clear? I hope it okay. was. Um, yeah. We have uh, uh, one other question. Uh, yeah. You mentioned that uh, generating all of the frames at once is uh, computationally infeasible. Can you explain mm -hmm. why, memory-wise, or other? Yeah, you can think about just stable diffusion, even without the inflation layers. What's the maximal batch size that you can input into stable diffusion without running out of memory? So it's not very big, right? <laughs> I mean, I've tried generating, I, I think for me with an A100, it was something like 32 frames or something like that, or 32 images. So just physically, you know, calculating the internal representations for the entire temporal duration of the video, even if you didn't have the temporal layers, it is, is heavy in terms of memory. Now, I don't know what kind of computational resources you guys have, but... <laughs> Most of the people don't have enough memory to just fit that amount of frames into your GPU, right? So it's going to be very hard. I don't want to say infeasible because I know that hardware is always progressing. It can always be better. <laughs> so I won't say infeasible. I'll say it's very hard to fit all the frames uh, in your GPU. Okay. So let's take a look at Lumiere's architecture, or in other words, how do we make this magic happen, this magic of generating all the frames together? So as we start every time, we'll start from the naive approach or the naive way to inflate models. So what we're seeing here is a basic unit structure that takes as input a noisy video and outputs a slightly less noisy video at a single diffusion step. And what we're seeing here is the unit structure where we have the down sampling, the middle block, and the up sampling. So a unit kind of uh, subsamples the spatial dimension. This means that each one of these frames is going to get smaller in terms of its height and width in each uh, uh, spatial uh, downsampling block here. So here the resolution is going to decrease versus the resolution that we started with. And in the bottom neck, the resolution is going to be pretty small. And the issue that we point out with Lumiere is that we do only spatial subsampling in the naive inflation approach. We don't do temporal subsampling. And that means that the entire temporal duration of the video is kind of uh, prolonged or dragged throughout this entire unit. And that makes the computations that we're making very hard, you know, in terms of memory to fit. So the idea of Lumiere, and by the way, this idea existed in previous work, such as the work that we're citing here, which is the earliest work that we could find that does this, uh, is to do, in addition to the spatial downsampling, also temporal downsampling, such that we do not decrease only the spatial dimensions of the video, but also the temporal dimension of the video. So each time that we do spatial subsampling, we'll also do temporal subsampling in order to reduce the size of the input that we're dealing with. Again, the size of the input is a big limitation as to how many frames we can fit at once, right? So now the network is going to be looking as follows. As you can see, we have convolutional blocks that are the blue blocks, convolutional inflated blocks, meaning we have the text to image layers plus the inflation layers that we talked about. And we have the attention blocks that are only present in the bottleneck. And we'll talk about that in a second. But each one of those blocks contains the pre-trained text to image layer, as we said, inflation. On top of that, the temporal layers that are the inflation layers. 
and skip connections, which is a common practice, you know, even when you train a control net or stuff like that, you always do kind of a skip connection with a linear projection before the skip connection. Now, the reason that we're putting the attention blocks on the bottleneck is that now we can shove a lot of compute here where the input size is very downscaled, right? So we can do most of our compute or most of the heavy lifting of the network here in the bottleneck where the representation is very compressed. And that is a principle that you know exists uh, for, in neural networks for a long time. And the idea behind that is that now we can shove a lot of parameters here without paying the price of uh, you know heavy memory requirements because the representation here is very much compressed, okay? So if we compare this approach to the keyframe approach that we saw before, we can think about this approach of temporal downsampling as kind of learning the keyframes on the go. The network with the temporal downsampling can learn to kind of narrow the amount of frames into representative keyframes. But now the keyframes are actually learned by the model and not just, you know, random time steps along uh, the process. And we also have those skip connections that help us kind of maintain the relation between our learned downsampled keyframes and uh, the entire temporal duration of the video. So what I need to tell you right now, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear yes, you. Yes, we can. Okay, I thought I got cut off for a second there. <laughs> what I need to tell you right now is how we do the temporal downsampling and upsampling. And it's actually a very, very naive and simple approach. So what we're going to do for the temporal downsampling is we're going to first do a 1D convolution. This 1D convolution is going to operate on that temporal dimension, meaning we're going to have a temporal kernel passing throughout all these uh, frames in the video. And then we're going to do striding, and striding means just taking every second frame. So you can think about this 1D convolution as kind of transferring information between each of the frames and the neighboring frames. So this frame is going to take a look at the frames that are neighboring it. And it's also going to have padding such that we're going to know the order of the frames, right? And this frame is going to, to receive information on its neighbors and so on and so forth. And then the striding is going to take each second keyframe that is learned from the 1D convolution, the previous convolutional operations that we've made during the block. So basically, this allows us to get uh, here keyframes that are learned by the model, OK? And then the temporal upsampling just as everything with the unit is going to be a mirror of the temporal downsampling. We're basically going to first duplicate each frame. So uh, one, one, two, two, three, three, and so on. And then do the same 1D convolution in order to transfer information between the frames, basically distincting between the frames, the duplicated frames. Do you have questions at this point? Do you have questions? Let's take a minute and see if you have any questions that now is a good time to write them in the chat. Yeah, now is a great time because we're going to move to initialization in just a second. OK, I'm going to assume that I did an awesome job <laughs> in explaining the architecture because we don't have questions. You did, but we, we do have one question. Um, oh, okay. Can you say uh, what are what type are the temporal layers that are added? Are they uh, convolution layers or? Oh, that, that's a fantastic question. So as I said, what we're doing is we're actually shoving all the attention operations in the bottleneck. So we have two types of temporal layers that we're using in the inflation. The temporal layers that you're seeing here that are based on 2D and 1D convolutions. The 2D convolutions are just spatial convolutions and the 1D convolutions are temporal convolutions, similar to the temporal downsampling. And in the bottleneck, in addition to the spatial attention that we're doing, uh, as usual, we're going to have also temporal attention, which temporal attention operates just as a needle attention. I won't get into the details because it's very common in other inflation models, such as maybe animative. Uh, but yeah, we have convolutions in all the resolutions. And in the bottleneck, we have convolutions and attention, uh, such that most of the parameters are in the bottleneck, as I said. Uh, one other question uh, that mm -hmm. I think uh, uh, we should uh, visit is, uh, is this stride fixed and how is it related to the uh, actual keyframes in the video? Okay, so the stride is four. Um, each one of the temporal downsampling layers subsamples each second frame. So the overall stride is four. So if we had 80 frames in the beginning, we'll have 20 frames in the bottleneck. And what was the second question there? 
uh, what's the relationship between the stride and the key keyframe? Uh, yeah, and the keyframes in the video. Okay, so the stride is basically going to determine what frames are going to be the keyframes. So the stride that we're taking each second frame, so each second frame is going to be the keyframe that I, I talked about that the model learns, kind of learns the keyframes. So the keyframes are going to be each second frame, each time we do the temporal subsampling. So in the bottleneck, it's each fourth frame that is going to be uh, the keyframe that we're talking about. But again, it's learned by the model. So it differs from uh, the approach that we talked about in the beginning. Okay, so let's move into initialization. So remember that we started from inflated models and we talked about the importance of kind of getting information from the spatial errors. We know that typically we do not have a lot of labeled data for videos, right? Probably a lot less than images. So most of the approaches that I know of, uh, also Sora, by the way, <laughs> either inflate an image model or train jointly on images and videos. Just because those two domains are pretty close to each other, and it seems that we can benefit a lot from the information in the spatial errors from the fixed image model. So the goal of good initialization is simply to keep us as close as possible to our initial text-to-image model, right? So again, let's take a look at the common inflation approach without temporal downsampling. We wanted the initialization to be as close as possible to the text-to-image model. So again, again, I said we have those skip connections here with the linear projections before them. So the idea is going to be very simple and similar to maybe a lot of methods that you know, such as control net. We're going to zero initialize the linear projections, such that basically at initialization, the output of each, each of these layers is equivalent to the output by the text to image model, right? And then if we look at the model at initialization and we generate a video of say 80 frames, what we're going to get are 80 unrelated frames, right? They're not consistent or coherent because we haven't trained the temporal layers yet, but they're going to be uh, uh, images that come from the text to image model because of the zero initialization. So we're going to be very close to the text to image initialization, which is a good thing, right? It's a good starting point for the optimization, especially if you have uh, low resources to train, not a lot of data and so on. But now, as I said for Lumiere, we added additional temporal layers, the temporal downsampling and upsampling layers, right? For the temporal downsampling and upsampling layers, we need to kind of figure out how to initialize them to best benefit from the text to image power that we have. So the first idea would be to randomly initialize those 1D convolutions, right? Because these are operations that are not learnable, so we don't have to initialize them. But if we do random initialization, then you can think about the input that comes into each of these layers as being out of distribution. Because we now did a random 1D convolution and then got random keyframes here and random keyframes here. And basically the entire kind of prior that we had from the text to image model is going to be just diminished. And we don't want to do that. So let's think about a better initialization for these uh, temporal downsampling and upsampling layers. So maybe an intuitive idea would be to initialize them with identity, okay? So basically each of these convolutions is going to do basically nothing. Just give us output the same input that it got. Now let's take a look at what we get in this case. So we have our original 80 frames, right? That are inserted into the model. And then the temporal downsampling just do does a stride. So we have now frames one, three through 77 and 79. And again, temporal downsampling with striding. So one, five through 77. Now notice this part because it's going to be the tricky part. When we do the upsampling, we duplicate each one of the frames, right? And I'll take a look at this skip connection. It kind of ruins the entire initialization for us because now we're connecting frame one to frame one, which is in distribution and okay, but we're connecting frame three to frame one, which are two unrelated frames that we have now connected, right? With the skip connection. And this issue gets even worse when we're talking about the finest resolution in which we have frame one duplicated four times. And here we're adding to frames two, three, and four, frame one, three times. So basically, all these frames, two, three, four, are going to be out of distribution. So frame one is going to be okay. Frames two, three, four are going to be out of distribution because we added with the skip connection two unrelated frames. Now let's take a look at what this looks like physically at initialization. So instead of getting high quality distant frames or unrelated frames, 
we're getting uh, an initialization where each fourth frame is a valid frame, right? And the number of valid frames or the uh, duration of valid frames is going to stem from our temporal downsampling factor. So if our temporal downsampling factor is eight, every eighth frame is going to be valid and so on and so forth. Um, so what you're seeing here are that the frames in the middle between each one of these segments are kind of blurry and not very much in distribution. So this is the price that you have to pay for the temporal downsampling, right? We have a lot of advantages from the temporal uh, down and up sampling, as we saw the temporal coherence and the simplicity of the framework, but the, at initialization, we cannot, or at least did not figure out in Lumiere, a way to get to the same initialization of the text to image model as we had before. Because those skip connections in the unit are very important, we didn't want to diminish them. So, so basically, we have, this a, is we have a question that's uh, yeah, sure. not, not in a question section, but can you uh, explain again where the misalignment comes from? It got a lot where of light, so I thought uh, I should ask it. Yeah, okay, where the misalignment comes from, sure. So we talked about the initialization. I just want to go back one slide. Okay, that was good. So we talked about that initialization, we want to stay as close as possible to the text to image model. So we said we would initialize the 1D convolutions with identity. And then I, I, I think, I hope it's kind of understandable why these frames are the frames that we're getting at each one of the resolutions. Here it's just striding, sampling each second frame, and here it's duplicating the frames. And in the unit, we have skip connections between each one of the uh, corresponding resolutions. So we have a skip connection that connects the output from here to the output from here with the same resolution in the down stack. And the down stack did not contain duplicated frames. It contained the uh, strided frames, right? And here we're connecting with the skip connection frame one to frame three, which are unrelated frames. And this is where the discrepancy comes from. So you can see that in the output of the model, right, this is the output that uh, predicts the clean frames from the noisy frames. In the output, we're connecting frame one to frame one, which is legitimate. And that's why the four, if every fourth frame is going to be okay. But then frame two is connected to frame one, which is out of distribution. Frame three is connected to frame one and frame four is connected to frame one. So each fourth frame is going to be okay because of those skip connections that are legitimate. But the other frames in the middle, in the, in the window in between, right, are strides, they're going to be illegitimate because of those skip connections that connected to unrelated frames. So I hope that's clear now. Um, and just to give you a motivation that even though this initialization is not optimal, it is still helpful. We did an experiment where we compared two types of initializations. The blue line is initializing with identity, as we saw right now, the convolutions are initialized with identity. And the orange line is initializing the convolutions in a, a random way, where each frame is kind of random. And you can see that the convergence is significantly better when, when we use the identity initialization, meaning the model can converge more easily when you give it a good starting point or a better starting point of the text to image model, or at least something that is close to the text to image model. And this is why we kind of put an emphasis on the initialization. Do you have any other questions? Okay, no. I think we're good for now. Yeah. Uh, so let's kind of summarize the design choices that we've made for Lumiere. The first design choice was to compress our signal or our video both spatially and temporally, right? We compressed the video both in space and in time. And uh, accordingly, we had to kind of modify the initialization of the model to stay as close to the text to image model as possible. And also we chose to perform the majority of our computation or put the majority of our parameters in the bottleneck of the unit where the representation was compressed. So these are kind of the key design choices that we've made in order to be able to physically generate all the frames together. During Okay, so as I said, the next thing we need to discuss, and I'm going to discuss it very briefly, uh, is the spatial super resolution model. So as I said, again, for the maybe 40th time, Lumiere is an inflated model. It means that it's generating videos in the same spatial resolution as the text to image model. 
And as I said, we're using Imagine as our base text to image model. And Imagine generates images in resolution of 128 by 128. And then there is the spatial super resolution model that is responsible of just upsampling the spatial resolution of the video. So basically taking our 128 by 128 uh, videos and upsampling them to 1024 by 1024 videos in order to produce high quality videos. So the spatial super resolution model is going to work with a much larger uh, uh, resolution, right? Our model previously worked with 128 by 128. The spatial super resolution model is going to work with 1024 by 1024. So it's not going to be able to, again, physically process the entire temporal duration of the video at once, even if you use a 3D unit, just because the size of the input is that much bigger, okay? So we are going to have to use strided windows in order to do the spatial super resolution. Now, the common approach to doing spatial super resolution is just a sliding window, as we saw before with the temporal super resolution. We take each one of those windowed frames, say T1 to T8, to T10, sorry, and we do spatial super resolution in that window. But as we know, it's never too good to do uh, super resolution in a window without knowledge of kind of your neighbors. So no global information is always a bad decision. Um, so what this causes are boundary artifacts, and I'm seeing that the presentation is kind of cut off, uh, so you cannot see that perfectly. But I hope you can see here on the right, the XT slice that we're marking here. If you remember the XT slices from the wooden figurines. And you can actually see the lines between each, uh, oops, sorry, between each window of eight frames. You can see them here and here and here and here. These are called boundary artifacts, meaning every time we kind of move from one window to another, we get a slight jump in the video just because the model does not know or does not have context from the other windows. So what we do to solve this is very simple and is a very common approach. Uh, we just do a SSR in a sliding window and average the predictions across the sliding window. Now, I'm not going to get into it, but if you're very interested in how this works, you're welcome to read a paper called Multidiffusion, which kind of does something similar on uh, to generate uh, panoram wind, uh, uh, images from text to image models. So I won't get into details because we don't have a lot of time. But just so you know, the idea is basically to average predictions across a sliding window. And what you're seeing here are the XT slices before applying the averaging and after applying the averaging. I do hope that you're also seeing the uh, videos, although they are kind of cut off. But you can see that the uh, boundary artifacts that we saw here or the boundary kind of uh, uh, jumps that we're seeing here are diminished or mitigated by the average because now we kind of have a sliding window where we average a prediction across several uh, predictions such that this mitigates the boundary artifact. Any questions so far? So uh, one question is uh, about the uh, SSR model. So mm -hmm. can you, uh, are there alternative approach? Can you maybe get rid of it? Rid of it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so that's a great question. Uh, you can get rid of it. Uh, Imagine is a model that works in the pixel space, um, but we do know that latent diffusion models are pretty awesome. So if we operated on a latent space instead of the pixel space, we might just operate with Lumiere on a downscaled space and then have kind of a VAE that encodes and decodes the model, the video, and then we wouldn't have to use an SSR model. Um, so getting rid of SSR is definitely a positive. <laughs> if you're inflating a latent model, that could be awesome. Okay, so let's move on to the greatest part of the talk, results and applications. <laughs> Uh, so hopefully you can see the results here, even though we're on Zoom and I kind of get the sense that uh, my PowerPoint is not really functioning that well. <laughs> uh, but you can maybe see that the astronaut here is walking uh, coherently and consistently and we're getting uh, high resolution videos. And I do encourage you to take a look at our uh, kind of promotional video that uh, our manager in Bal created. It's really visually pleasing and it's nice to look at some results. Um, so here are some of the applications that you can do pretty trivially with Lumiere. 
the first thing you can do is instead of generating from text, you can add another condition of an image. So basically what we do is we take those three channels of the image and we concatenate them uh, to the noise that is inserted into the model. And we fine tune the model with video such that we uh, concatenate the first frame of the video. And then the model kind of learns to rely on that extra signal because it's very helpful, right, for the denoising process. And then during inference, we can use a single frame in order to animate an image based on uh, based on a text prompt. So for example, here we have this famous painting and we can do a girl winking and smiling. And I think this result is really amusing because we probably all are familiar with this art piece and it's kind of fun to see it come to life. So this is one of my favorite applications. Um, and then here I kind of uh, included a compilation of some results with Lumiere, but I'm getting the sense that the video is cut off, so I won't kind of dwell on it, just move on. Now, another application that we thought that was really cool, again, Lumiere is an inflated model for the 50th time. <laughs> All right, so basically, we do not fine tune the text to image weights. And what that means is that probably similar to other approaches such as animate diff, we can maybe insert fine tuned text to image weights into the model to kind of do cool stuff with videos. So for example, we want to do stylized generation for videos based on just a reference image. So if we have here our text to image weights that are fine tuned on this thicker style, and you can see that the fine tuning was successful and the model outputs various images in the thicker style. So now what we would want to do is just inject those fine tuned layers into the text to video model and have the temporal layers animate those stickers to something that is kind of video or, or, or has motion. But what we're seeing is that when we're just inserting the fine-tuned spatial layers as is, we're getting very significant artifacts, okay? And we're kind of assuming that the reason for that is that the temporal layers trained on a certain distribution of outputs from the spatial layers. And now we have significantly kind of deviated from the distribution with the fine-tuned texture image weights. And then the temporal layers don't really know how to handle those fine-tuned texture image weights. And then the artifacts that we're seeing are stemming from this deviation in distribution. So our the idea to fix this deviation in distribution is going to be inspired by similar works done on GANs. So what we're going to do is we're going to interpolate between the pre-trained weights, the pre-trained texture image weights, and the fine-tuned text to image weights. Such that now, instead of using just the fine-tuned text to image weights, each fine-tuned text to image weight is going to be weighted by alpha times the fine-tuned weight, uh, plus one minus alpha, the pre-trained weight. So basically what we're doing is we're taking our fine-tuned weights and bringing them a bit closer to the distribution of the original model to prevent those other distribution artifacts that we're seeing. And the results were pretty stunning, at least to me, because what I expected to get were kind of videos with realistic motion that portray the style from the reference image. But the result was entirely different. We kind of saw that the motion in the video is adapted from the spatial style. So you can see here that the, the motion here is not realistic motion. It's kind of drawing the scene and coloring the parrot here. So the motion that the model has learned to kind of match with the fine-tuned spatial layers is corresponding or is determined by the spatial style that we're using. Um, and I've enclosed here a video of some of the stylus generation results that we have. I do hope that you can see it. So you can see more realistic styles, such as this glowing style, where you're getting more realistic motion, versus styles like such as this 3D style, where you're getting real 3D motion, uh, the lion, for example. The sticker style that we talked about, kind of painting or animating uh, scenes. Uh, the illustration here that you're seeing kind of makes things pop out and illustrate the scene part by part. And some additional realistic motion examples. So basically, one of the surprising features was, was that just by fine-tuning the text to image weights, we could get personalized motion as well. Another cool feature that we can do are cinemagraphs. And cinemagraph just means taking an image and animating it only in a specific bounding box or a specific part of the image. So what we do here is, again, based on fine tuning, uh, we concatenate to the noise first the first frame without noise, so the first frame clean. 
And in all the other frames, we concatenate uh, the, the next frames, but we black out the part that we want to kind of inpaint or fill in. And the model learns to keep all the parts that are outside the black box that we're inputting into it as is, because it's optimal to kind of maintain uh, best cleaning or best uh, denoising. And only animate or change the parts that are inside the black box. And since we're concatenating the clean frame in the first frame, uh, it learns to kind of keep the content that is in the bounding box as well. And then at inference, we can include a frame, a single frame. In the first frame, it's going to be clean. In the next frame, we're going to kind of uh, black out the part that we want to animate. And then the model is going to animate only that part based on the prompt. So for example, here, a butterfly flapping its wings. You can see that only the butterfly is moving. The other parts of the image were just copied by the model because this is what we kind of encourage during fine tuning. Another cool thing that we can do with Lumiere is since Lumiere is again an inflated model and generates all the frames at once, we can just apply out of the box existing editing methods from text to image and edit videos based on them. So this is SD edit. We take an input video we add noise to it up to a certain time step, and then we denoise it with a new prompt. So we denoise the video of this woman running with made of flowers. And you can see that it turns the woman, it keeps the motion and it keeps the pose, but it turns the woman into a woman made of flowers. And obviously in painting is implemented in a very similar way to the cinemagraphs. We just uh, concatenate the uh, frames with the blacked out parts to the uh, noise and we fine tune the model and to complete the missing parts. And here I included a short clip of editing that you can do with inpainting with Lumiere and also with SD edit. So one of the selling points, I think the main selling points of Lumiere is that you can enable or unlock many applications from the text to image realm or from existing methods pretty easily and the model is very adaptable. So we showed a lot of applications that were pretty easy to implement. I'm done. Thank you so much for listening. And I will take questions if we have them now. Thank you very much. That was super interesting. Um, so we do have some questions. I'll start from like least technical to technical. Um, yeah. So uh, can you also generate videos in different aspect ratios? Or can you extend uh, existing videos? So uh, regarding different aspect ratios, the answer is that we didn't train on different aspect ratios. And so we did try that during inference because we do not have in our attention layers, we do not have kind of fixed positional encoding. We only have relative positional encoding. So that works. It works. You can generate with Lumiere videos with different aspect ratios. The truth is that the model is not trained on different aspect ratios. So they're not as good as the aspect ratio that we originally trained on. But you can definitely do that. And I did it with SD edit and got some pretty decent results. So you can do that. It's possible. And uh, now we have some questions on the weight interpolation. Can you go yeah. back to this? Uh... Yeah, sure. Let me try so... to get back to the slides. <laughs> it's easier to ask the questions when I see the slide. <laughs> oh, OK. Uh, let me let me try. No, you don't have to. Okay, that that one is really not my friend today. <laughs> okay, so what's the question? So uh, do you have any thoughts on uh, if you fine tune the model with some constraints on not getting too far from the original weights, would that work in the same way? Would that achieve? Did you try also other solutions for that? Yeah, so that, that's a valid question. We have actually explored several solutions for that. I, I personally did this part, so, so I know how much work it, it took to kind of get to something that was working and robust. I have tried exploring different other solutions and I have to say that the weight interpolation worked best. Um, if you kind of fine tune the weights with the objective of not getting too far from the original text to image weights, I know that there are some works that do that. I'm not sure if that's very helpful. Um, just because I saw that some of the weights, there is some, with this uh, slide, it's kind of showing a consistent or a single coefficient for each one of the weights. And I have seen that some weights can be interpolated much heavier than other weights. So I think from what I've seen, 
Um, this interpolation works really well because you can kind of play with the coefficients of different layers. And different layers interact differently with the temporal layers. So there's an additional kind of layer, to abuse the word layer again, uh, additional layer of complexity there because of the interaction, the interleaving interaction between the temporal and spatial weights. I do know that there are several works trying to not deviate too much from the distribution of the text to image model. It's interesting, I haven't tried them personally. I just wanted to use the pre the fine tune text image weights as fast as possible without kind of uh, having to retrain things. Uh, it's interesting to try. I have some intuition that it might not work perfectly, just because different, as I said, different spatial layers interact differently with the temporal layers. For example, in the bottleneck, I saw that uh, in the attention layers, I can weight the interpolation much heavier without harming the uh, the motion, probably because it's just the keyframes and and maybe it harms the motion less than in the finer layer where you actually come in interaction with every single one of the frames. So I hope that answers the question, but it's still open for research. Do you have any thoughts on why, uh, how come it doesn't cause any artifacts in the generated videos? Uh, the interpolation? Yeah. Okay, so as I said, the intuition behind the interpolation is driving the weights as close as we can to the original text to image distribution. So there's a trade off. If you push the text to image weights too far away from the distribution, it's going to become out of distribution to the temporal weights. So you have to find kind of the sweet spot between over fine tuning and staying close enough to the distribution in order for the temporal layers to be able to interact with your spatial layers. And then basically what I think this interpolation does is you have this kind of uh, array of weights or array of or distribution that the temporal weights know how knows how to deal with. And then when you do the interpolation, you kind of narrow that distribution. You can see that actually the motion that you're getting for each one of those videos is consistent. So it feels like we kind of shifted or narrowed down the distribution from the text to image weights such that the temporal layers know to kind of correlate those weights with a specific motion. So we actually narrowed down the distribution of the motion that we can get, which makes sense because we did stylization or personalization. And then the interpolation kind of finds a sweet spot between being too far away from the distribution and too close to the distribution such that we do not get any, uh, any difference. And as I said, a single interpolation scale is not always good. So sometimes you kind of need to scale the different layers differently. So I played around with this quite a bit uh, for the paper. Thank you. That, that's a really interesting uh, topic. Uh, so another question that we have is on uh, CFG, classified free guidance. And yeah. did you have any experiments with that? How does that incorporate into your architecture? Um, unfortunately, I cannot elaborate too much on the classified free guidance that we use. I can't say that we use the same scheme as the text to image model, but there are some works and some research that we kind of intended to do maybe in the future on changing the scheduler or the noise scheduler for videos, um, such that we add more noise in more steps. Uh, but, but that's all I can say on that. Thank you. Um, so if anyone has any more questions, now is a good time to write them uh, and we'll ask what the, what we can, and otherwise, I think we'll uh, say good night. So take a minute and see if you have any more questions. So we'll take uh, one last question on the initialization, which I, I think you might have answered about um, zero initialization. Did you try that? I think you talked about that, right? Yeah, so for zero initialization, it wouldn't work well for the uh, convolutions because if we initialize them to zero, then basically our keyframes are going to be zero. Um, so we had to kind of think about ways to initialize the uh, temporal downsampling such that it, it is a cl as close as possible to the text to image model, meaning it is almost as if we didn't do the temporal subsampling. Um, so we had to kind of think about initialization that is as close as possible to doing nothing which is why I also showed the uh, original kind of common or naive approach in which you do not downsample at all. So when you do not downsample at all, there's nothing kind of uh, problematic there. 
Um, and then we kind of had to initialize the weights as close as possible to that initial point of just not doing temporal down sampling at all. So in it, it, identity initialization is the closest that we can get to not doing temporal down sampling at all. Thank you very much. I think uh, we'll wrap it up for today. It was super interesting and thank you very much for uh, taking the time to talk to us. Thank you so much for inviting me. I had a pleasure. And if you have any other questions, please feel free to email me or reach out to me. I'm available on almost every platform, I'm afraid. We also have uh, our WhatsApp group. Uh, I'll post the link in the chat. If you want to chat about the, uh, the talk or see our next talks, uh, that's a good place. The discussion is mostly in Hebrew in the WhatsApp group, um, so beware. But uh, English discussions are also welcomed. So. Uh, We'll just post the link. Thank you very much, Ila. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Good night.